When we look at the Old Testament scriptures, we see a consistent plan from the beginning to show this people that God would call his own that he would use to bring his Messiah into the world. We see a consistent story from Genesis all the way through Malachi as as scripture prepares us um, for the coming of Jesus in whom we have our faith. Um, Every story we see has a, has a, has a relation to, uh, to that plan from God. Um, we see Abraham, the stories of how God favored him, of how he walked with God, how he promised, how God promised him that he would um, bless all nations through his seed. We see Exodus and God bringing his people out of captivity into a land of their own. We see the struggles of Israel up and down throughout the years as they strive to be his people, his covenant people. And finally, we, we, we leave off in Malachi at the end of the Old Testament scriptures for a promise of something that's to come, of a prophet that will come and pave the way for, um, for the Lord Jesus. Um, every book in the Old Testament figures into that plan. All 38 of them, except for there's 39. There's one book in the Old Testament that is a bit of an outlier. It doesn't figure into that story. In fact, it has nothing to do with the Jewish people, nothing directly to do with the Jewish people. It doesn't speak to their history. It doesn't really even speak about the coming Messiah. And yet it's a, an important part of the, the Old Testament scripture and one that we're familiar with. That's the book of Job. Job has no Jews in it. There's no Israelites mentioned anywhere in the book of Job. I mean, yet it's one that we're very familiar with. The last couple of weeks, the children's classes have even been studying that um, and the, the wisdom that's contained in there. Um, book is, uh, the, the book of Job is it's, it's the quintessential book about human suffering. It shows God's relationship with man and the, the interaction between them and, and right and wrong and, and judgment and justice. Those principles are all throughout this book of Job. Um, and we're familiar with the story, aren't we? Um, we know that Job is a, the greatest man in the East. He's this, this wealthy man, but much more importantly, he's a righteous man in the eyes of, of God. Um, God has blessed him rich, richly with, with flocks and with servants. He's got ten grown children. Um, he's got a wife. He has everything that man could want. Um, he is righteous in God's eyes, and he has great faith in his Lord, and he knows who he is. He's confident in his own identity as he seeks to please God. Um, we're familiar with that story, but then remember the, the contest, if you will, for lack of a better word, between God and Satan, um, where he says, yes, Job is righteous because you protect him, because you bless him. Um, if you take that away, God, um, Job will turn and curse you um, because he's only righteous because you bless him. And God says, okay, take away everything he has. We know how the story goes. Job loses all of his flocks. He loses almost all his servants, except for the ones who can come and tell him about him losing his flocks. He loses all ten of his children at once. Um, he's left with nothing but a, a nagging wife, which uh, should be his greatest source of strength, but instead, instead she's failed him um, as well, as she also is suffering from, from this great loss. But the story goes on because Job remains faithful, and Satan, Satan doubles down and says it's only because he's healthy, and you haven't allowed me to touch him. So God says, okay, you can afflict him, just don't take his life. Satan afflicts Job mightily in his health, covered with boils. Um, On top of the grief and the loss that he's already dealing with, he's now suffering great pain as he mourns and tries to struggle with his faith. But we also know the end of the story, that that Job struggles... um, that he doesn't understand why God is, is letting this happen. He questions God. In the end, God is going to, to explain things and, and help Job better understand the, the proper perspective. And then God blesses Job with all, these, um, all the blessings he had before twofold, twice as many flocks and servants, and his, he gets ten more children. Everything's restored to him, and his faith is even greater than before. This is a familiar story to us. Um, I want to draw our lesson tonight from 
the book of Job, but I don't want to talk about any of that. I don't want to talk about Job's three friends who came and, and tried to uh, tell him that he needed to give up and, and curse God. We're not going to talk about that because there's another section of Job that we don't often look at. We usually look at the very beginning and the very end, and we skip most of the middle. Um, but besides Job and his wife and God and Satan and Job's three friends, there's another character in the book of Job that we almost never touch. In fact, after Job, this character says more than anyone else in the book of Job. And most of you are probably scratching your heads like, who is Aaron talking about? Um, well, that's the, that's the character I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about Elihu. Elihu is the young man we read about in the book of Job that doesn't get much attention from us at all. In fact, if I've ever heard a sermon on Elihu, I don't recall it. Um, but yet Elihu is a prominent character in the story of Job, and we're going to talk about this mysterious man who we spend so little time on tonight, um, because he has a lot to say, a lot of valuable things to say that we can learn from, some wisdom that we can garner from him, and more importantly, God included him in the book of Job for a reason, um, and it's, we would be remiss if we skip over that. In fact, there's six whole chapters where Elihu is talking um, and most of us don't know what he says. So we're going we're gonna to see if we can uh, learn from Elihu in our time tonight. Um, we don't know a lot about Elihu, even looking at him in scriptures. Job 32 is where we're going to start. If you want to turn over to Job, we will primarily be in the text of Job tonight. We'll, we'll go a few places otherwise. But uh, Job 32 to 37 is where we read about Elihu. Um, He's a son of Barakel the Buzzite. If that doesn't help you, it doesn't help me. It doesn't help any biblical scholars either because nobody knows who Barakel is or who a Buzzite is or, or where, he, where he's from. We know nothing about this man, Elihu, except what little he's going to offer us. Um, but in Job 32, verse 2, we see him introduced. Um, he says, But the anger of Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzzite, of the family of Ram, burned against Job. His anger burned because he justified himself before God. Um, we do know that he was young. Um, in uh, chapter 32, verse 6, he says, um, So Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite, spoke out and said, I am young in years, and you are old. Um, therefore, I was shy and afraid to tell you what I think. So literally, the only demographic information we have about this, this Elihu is that he was young. Um, now, when we say that young is a relative term, um, I still think I'm young, and, and those of you that are young will laugh at that. But uh, those of you that are older, if I ask Bob, Job, or Charlotte, they might say I'm young. Young can be a relative term, but I think we properly should understand that Elihu is, is young compared to Job, and that's what, that's what matters. Um, we don't know how Job is at the start of the story. We know he's risen to be the greatest man of the East. We know that he's got 10 grown children. We know that at the end of the story, he lives 140 more years. Um, this is in the patriarchal age when, when people are living longer. So this is not a normal lifespan. So Elihu might be 20, he might be 50, he might be 100. We don't really know. But compared to Job and his three friends, Elihu is a young man. And that's going to factor into what he has to say as we go on here. Um, we also can infer that he's been a, an attentive listener to the, the discussion between Job and his three friends. Remember, the three friends come to Job. They sit for a week and don't say a word. They just sit and mourn with Job as he's um, torn his clothes, as he has ashes on his head, as he sits and mourns and grieves for his circumstance. Then these men open up and start discussing with Job and, and basically saying, Job, I don't know what you did, but clearly you've done something wrong because look at your circumstance. God would not have done this to you unless you, had, unless you were wicked. Um, that's the discussion. Job is rightly defending himself um, because Job was not a wicked man. Um, but that discussion between the three friends goes on. We can, we can infer as you read through the, the, the discourse between Job and his friends that it's not just Job and his three friends. Job is, is great. People have flocked to see what has happened to this man who was so great. Elihu seems to be one of those who have come to listen to, um, to what has happened, to observe and see what happens to this great man, 
Job. He is listening to the discussion between Job and his three friends. And he's probably not alone, but he's the one that we have speak up. Um, and his words recorded um, later on in this book of Job, this great book of poetry. In 32 through 37 is when we see Elihu actually open his mouth and speak to Job and his three friends. And he's going to address all of them, not just Job, not just the three friends. He speaks out after being silent, being attentive, and listening. Um, And we don't have time to read all these six chapters. I would encourage you to do that sometime this week if you have opportunity. And listen to the words of Elihu as, as... after we discuss a little bit about who he is and his role in this, this great story that God's preserved for us. Um, his charge is that God, or that Job has justified himself before God. And Job absolutely has done that. Job doesn't understand. He's, he demands a, a trial before God. He says, where is God? Come and explain to me what I've done that I'm suffering to such a, such a great extent. Um, and and it, it seems to escalate as the story goes on. Um, Job is, is, is desperate. He's hurting. He's grieving. He is speaking out to God in a way that, that God patiently allows to a point. Elihu is not quite as patient as God is. Elihu speaks out before God does, and God will at the end of the book. Um, but Elihu is going to speak out and say, Job, you can't talk that way. Um, he speaks out against Job and his, his apparent self-righteousness. Um, he's also going to come condemn the three friends because the three friends come to Job and says, say, you are wrong, Job. You have sinned. We don't know what you did, but you clearly sinned. And, and they can't prove it, but they condemn him nonetheless. So Elihu's going to make the argument to these friends that you can't condemn someone just on their circumstance. You can condemn someone with evidence, um, but there is no evidence that Job had done anything wrong. Um, when God allows Satan to, uh, to afflict him. So that's Elihu's charge against, against these men that he's going to go into. Um, again, we don't know much about Elihu, so the lesson is not particularly on Elihu himself, but on some lessons that we can learn from Elihu's words and lessons that, that apply to us that we can use in our lives, looking through the, the story of Job, through the lens of Elihu, if you will. That's the plan Um, for our time together this evening. Um, So let's first look at this idea of wisdom um, as as we see it with this character, Elihu. Um, The first thing we need to point out is that Elihu has great reverence for his elders, for those that are older than him, these wise men, um, Job and Eliphaz and and, um, Bildad and Zophar, these men that, that... should be wise, that he's looked up to clearly, that he respects. He shows them great reverence and deference in listening to what they say. Um, and that's, that may be an obvious point, but it's one that in our society we don't handle very well. Our society has gone from respecting those that are elderly, those that have, have done their time in life, to kind of out, considering them as outcasts. Um, I, I got off the plane the other day after a flight, and there was, there was a middle-aged couple, and they were helping, I think it was a mother and an aunt that were elderly off the plane, um, and telling them, okay, you need to come here and bring your bag. And, and the, the middle-aged lady that got off shook her head and said, it's like traveling with toddlers. And that's kind of how we as a society sometimes look at those that are older. And that's not the right way. That's not what we see in Scripture as a way to teach those who have lived longer than us, who have fought the battles in this life. Elihu understood um, that it was right and proper to show great um, respect to, to his elders. Um, look at his words here in, in chapter 32, um, beginning in verse 4. Um, now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were years older than he. I'll jump down to verse 7. I thought age should speak in increased years should teach wisdom. That was Elihu's attitude towards these older men, and that's the attitude that we need to adopt. We should wait to speak and hear those that are older that have wisdom to share with us Um, because that's usually the case. Those that are older have had more opportunity to accrue wisdom, and we need to, that those of us that are younger need to accept that and, and know our place before those that are older. 
that's something that I think we need to be reminded of. I'm a fact that we can easily lose sight of because, as I mentioned, our society seems to have lost sight of that fact. Turn over to Proverbs. Um, we'll look at several passages in Proverbs as well, but we're going to be primarily in Job, so don't, don't lose your place there. But Proverbs 16, uh, 31. Proverbs 16, 31. Solomon says, A gray head is a crown of glory. It is found in the way of righteousness. A crown of glory. A few chapters over in, in, in chapter 20, verse 29. 2029 of Proverbs. The glory of the young men is their strength, and the honor of old men is their gray hair. Um, being older is not a bad thing. That's the way God set it up. We are born, we age, um, eventually we're going to die. That is not a bad thing. That is the way it is. And we shouldn't look at it in a negative way. Elihu did not, and we need to be reminded of the fact that we need to have that same attitude as Elihu did towards those who are older. Having said that, Elihu was wise beyond his years. Again, I don't know how old he is. Um, teenagers, this doesn't mean that you can think you're Elihu and your parents are Job and ignore what they have to say. But in this story, it is Elihu who shows more wisdom than Job, more wisdom than Job's three friends. Um, Job 32, verse 9. Um, again, hopefully you still have a finger there in, in, in Job 32 and verse 9. Um, the abundant in years may not be wise nor may elders understand justice. While it is certainly true that those that are older have had more opportunities to accrue wisdom, it does not happen automatically. Just because you are older does not mean you are necessarily wiser. You should be, but that's not a guarantee. That's not automatic. Um, wisdom doesn't come just with age. There's more to it than that. Um, if you turn over to a familiar passage, but I think it's worth looking at again in 1 Timothy, um, Paul's words to his young protege. Um, remember in, in Timothy, Paul has left um, Timothy behind in Ephesus, the city where Paul knows better than anywhere else. He spends longer in Ephesus than anywhere else. He sends, or leaves Timothy behind as he moves on. Um, he tells Timothy um, when talking to giving them instructions about how to teach these people after he's gone. He says, um, verse 12, um, I'm in Thessalonians. It's going to work better if I'm in Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 12, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself as an example to those who believe. The church in Ephesus had elders. We read about them in, in Acts 20 that Paul goes and visits. Remember, they come and cry when they, can't, they hear that they won't see his face again. They had an eldership. Um, they had a, a properly organized church, and yet he still leaves this young man, Timothy, to teach these people because he had great confidence in who Timothy was and his character and the wisdom that Timothy possessed. Um, Timothy was a young man. Again, we don't know exactly how old he was at this point, but clearly under 30, um, if you, if you look at some of the, the stories there, probably, probably uh, more in his mid-20s. He's a young man, and yet he's told to teach this congregation in Ephesus, including the elders that are there. So those are that, that are older, again, a relative term, it is a mistake to look at those that are younger and think that they can't teach me anything. That's not accurate. Timothy was teaching the Ephesians. Elihu is about to teach Job and his three friends not because he's young, but because what he says is valid, because what he says is true. So as a congregation, we need to not disrespect those who are younger either because they have a vital place um, in our family. They have an important role in, in teaching us as well. So if age doesn't have to come with wisdom, what does it, or wisdom doesn't have to come with age, what does it come from? Well, wisdom is obviously from God, the source of wisdom. Back in Job 32, Elihu even states this as if, as if we need reminding. He says, but a spirit, it is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives them understanding. 
Uh, the breath of the Almighty gives them understanding. Wisdom comes from God. Again, back over to Proverbs 2. Um, we see a similar thing when Solomon talking to his, his son and leaving instructions. Um, Proverbs 2, verse 6, beginning. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. Wisdom comes from the Lord, not from any academic learning in this world, not necessarily from age. It comes from considering God's universal truths, considering his nature, pondering them, meditating on them, and, and putting them into practice. That's how, we, that's how wisdom is gained. Um, wisdom comes from God. It's, it's not with age, it's with effort. Age allows you to have more opportunities, as I said before, um, to accrue this wisdom. Um, you're already there in Proverbs 2. Back up to verse 4. Um, again, talking about pursuing wisdom, Solomon says, If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Seek for her as silver. That's an active looking for wisdom. It doesn't just come. You have to work to gain wisdom. And in a couple chapters over in, in chapter um, 4, Solomon says, Acquire wisdom. Acquire understanding. Do not forget. Do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Um, do not forsake her, and she will guard you. Love her, and she will watch you. Um, verse 7, The beginning of wisdom is... Acquire wisdom. I used to think that was the silliest verse. Acquire wisdom? You get wisdom by acquire wisdom, but that's exactly what you do. You can't get wisdom unless you seek to actually get wisdom. It's not accidental. It's very intentional, this, this quest for, for wisdom. Um, prize her, verse 8, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. Again, our society doesn't place great emphasis on wisdom. There's some cultures that do, especially some of the Far Eastern cultures. Um, because our society doesn't, that can't stop us from actively pursuing wisdom, which, as we talked about, only comes from um, the Almighty. Elihu clearly has set his heart to pursue, to acquire wisdom, and he's able to share that wisdom with Job and his three friends here in these chapters in this story. Um, let's talk a little bit about Elihu's um, bringing up of his challenge, if you will, to Job and his three friends. Because I think there's some lessons that we can learn for how we interact with each other when we look at how and what exactly Elihu brings up. He doesn't just say, I have wisdom and you don't. Listen to what I say. That, that's not what we see with Elihu. We already talked about the reverence he had for this age, but... Elihu waits patiently to speak. Um, back, in, back in Job 32, um, let's read uh, 11 and, and the first part of verse 12. Behold, I waited for your words. I listened to your reasonings while you pondered what to say. I even paid close attention to you. When we have a disagreement with each other, and we will, we're a family. Most of you grew up with siblings. Did you not fight with your siblings? Um, I don't think it's just me that fought with my siblings, and it's not just my kids that fight with each other. That's pretty normal. We are a family, children of God. Even though most of us are grown, we still bicker and fight. Um, it'd be nice if that wasn't the case, but that's the reality. Um, we're going to disagree with each other, sometimes on valid things, sometimes maybe on things that are trivial. Um, but when we disagree with each other, there's a right way and a wrong way to handle that disagreement. And Elihu can offer us some wisdom on how to do that. He waits patiently to speak. He listens attentively to the argument. He's not just saying, okay, hurry up and finish so I can talk. He's genuinely considering what Job and his three friends are saying as they go back and forth with their discussion. He is waiting patiently and, and trying to understand their reasoning. Um, and as he does that, he, he's getting increasingly frustrated, admittedly. Um, 
because their reasoning is not sound, but he's nonetheless considering what they have to say. And this reminds me of, of James, the first chapter. Again, another familiar verse, but um, the only place in the New Testament that Job is mentioned is in the book of James. And I can't help but think that, that James might have had the book of Job in, in a couple places in mind in, in some of his, his writing here. James chapter 1, um, verse 19 um, James says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but let every one be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Elihu was quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. He listened attentively first, then he spoke. And as, as we see here, and especially if you take the time and, and read through these chapters, he gets angry. He is, he is angry at what's going on here, um, but he doesn't start that way. Um, it's from listening, stopping and taking the time to listen. If we listen to each other's disagreements first and genuinely consider what's being said, we're probably going to not have near as many disagreements as if we just start shooting from the hip and, 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 and spouting our anger and our, what we have to say. But, but instead, if we stop and consider Elihu's example and stop and listen... Um, he speaks with great respect for these men, not just because they're older, but because he is genuinely, general, he genuinely regards them as individuals, as, as brothers. We need to look at each other that way. We love each other. We're commanded to love each other, and we don't love just because we're commanded. I think we generally like being around each other and, and enjoy each other's company. That doesn't change just because we disagree with each other on some, some point. We need to look at each other with love and have that attitude when we stop to address someone on whatever the issue might be. Um, over in chapter 33 now, let's, let's read the first seven verses here. Again, look at how Elihu speaks to Job and his, his three friends. Now, beginning in verse 1. Um, however now, Job... Please hear my speech and listen to my words. Behold now, I open my mouth, my tongue, and my mouth speaks. My words are from the uprightness of my heart. My lips speak knowledge sincerely. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Refute me if you can. Array yourself before me. Take your stand. Behold, I belong to God like you. I have been formed out of the clay. Behold, no fear of me should terrify you, nor should my pressure weigh heavily on you. Elihu's saying, I'm just a man like you, Job. I'm not greater than you. Sometimes when we speak to, to someone else and we might have a disagreement, we tend to speak down to someone. Elihu firmly believes that he's in the right with what he's about to say and that Job is in the wrong. Um, he doesn't speak down to him. He speaks on the same plane as him. And that's how we need to speak to each other because we're all equal in God's eyes, are we not? We are all children. Um, we don't have a greater rank one than the other um, when it comes to, to our place in, in, in this family. Um, we need to speak to each other on the same level as Elihu did. Um, over in uh, 34, you see a, a similar idea that um, he says, uh, the first couple verses there, Elihu continued and said, Hear my words, you wise men, and listen to me, you who know. He gives them credit. said, you guys are wise men. I'm not, I'm not doubting your wisdom. I'm disagreeing with you on this point. So he has that, that great respect and, and admiration um, for them as individuals and who they are. When we come at someone with that attitude, it's much more likely to be received than if we just start spouting out in anger. Um, Elihu, Elihu can teach us or remind us of that lesson. But he also seeks not to condemn them. Job's three friends are wrong. Um, Job has reached conclusions at this point in the story that are wrong. Elihu is not condemning them as people. He's correcting their, attempting to incorrect, um, to correct their incorrect uh, conclusions um, he's, he's addressing the matter, not the person, if you will. And that's, that's a reminder that, that we need to do the same, I think, when we are talking with each other and disagreeing with each other. Um, chapter 33, verse 32. He says, Then if you have anything to say, answer me. Speak. 
for I desire to condemn you. No, speak, for I desire to justify you. Justify means to make right. I'm trying to make you right, Job. I'm trying to help you. Um, so speak up. My goal is not to condemn you. It's to justify you. Um, again, back to James. If James wasn't thinking of Elihu and the story of Job before in, in that, that verse we read in chapter 1, I sure think he is in, in uh, chapter 5. Um, James chapter, chapter 5 in uh, verse uh, 20 is actually farther back in chapter 5 that he actually starts talking about Job. Um, but in verse 20 he says, um, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sin. Job, in the midst of his grief, he did not sin and curse God, but he is heading in a direction that Elihu, who has great regard for Job, wants to stop. The direction Job is, is going, that of challenging God, is, is um, you can debate exactly where the line of sin might be, but what you can't, what's not debatable is that he is heading in a direction that God is not accepting. I mean, that's why God's going to, beginning in, verse, in chapter 38, God's going to step in. Um, Elihu is trying to stop that, that direction that, that Job seems to be heading in. Um, and he's doing it out of position of love, not trying to condemn, but to make Job right. He's, he's, he's trying to do it out of love. And that's what we need to do, because love can cover a multitude of sin. If you see me sinning, I want you to stop me. I don't want you to say, well, Aaron might get mad at me. Aaron might snap at me. Maybe I will. But if you love me, you would step in and say something. That's what I think Elihu is doing here. That's what James says we need to do. We'll skip uh, 1 Peter 4. It says a very similar thing. Peter says um, this idea of love can, can, can stop someone from sinning. It's, it's, it's the attitude we need to have towards each other. Um, Elihu can teach us a lot on our interaction with each other. Um, but perhaps the greatest thing that Elihu can teach us um, is that of, of how to suffer humans. That's what the book really is about. But if you think about the book of Job as a whole, Job doesn't answer the fundamental question that's plagued man from the beginning of why does God allow man to suffer? Job, Job the man never answers that. He, he asks that. He doesn't understand that. He never answers the question in any of his words. The three friends don't answer that question. God answers it, but not in a very, it is a, it is a very direct in one way, but it's, it's indirect in another way. He doesn't say it in, in terms of the discourse like Job and his three friends are having it. It's a lie who is going to spell out the answer to that question of why God allows man to suffer. Now, we need to, again, understand the context. Elihu is not suffering, as far as we can tell. He's an, he's an observer. He's not in pain. He's not grieving. His faith has not been rattled like Job's has. I can't fathom what Job is going through at this point. None of us, all of us have suffered to some degree, some more than others, but none of us have suffered like Job has. Job is in the midst of that. His, his faith in what he thought God to be is, is wavering. This objective um, observer of, in Elihu is, is in a position where he can alter Job's course so he can get back on the right track of understanding God in the proper context. He offers us in that light some things that we can consider for when we get to the point of suffering. So why does God allow man to suffer? Um, If you haven't listened to this point in the sermon, um, if you're asleep, if you're distracted, you can ignore anything I've said to this point, because what I'm about to say is critically important, and this is the greatest thing that I think Elihu teaches us, one that men have always struggled for, struggled with, the answer to this question, why does God, a righteous God, allow man to suffer? And the answer is not one that we're going to want to hear. The answer that Elijah's going to give us, and we'll look in just a minute, is 
We have no right to ask that question. None. Who is man to ask the Almighty why he does what he does? That question is absolutely erroneous. And that's what Elihu's going to say. Um, turn over to chapter 33. Verse 12, chapter 3. Let's actually back up to verse 8. Because he's going to requote what Job is saying. Um, verse 8, chapter 33. Again, Elihu's going to start quoting Job. And then he's going to put his own words in there. Surely you have spoken in my hearing. And I have heard the sound of your words. I am pure without transgression. I am innocent. This is Elihu quoting Job. I am innocent, um, and there is no guilt in me. Behold, Job saying, Behold, he invents, he, God, invents pretexts against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in stocks. He watches all my paths. Okay, now Elihu is going to introduce his own words here in verse 12, and listen carefully. Behold, let me tell you, Job, you are not right in this. You are not right in this. For God is greater than man. That's not what we typically hear, but that is the answer. Why does God allow man to suffer? You can't ask that. God can do whatever he wants. If we accept that God is the Almighty, if we put our faith in him and know that he is the creator of the universe and that we are the creature how dare we stop and ask God why he's doing something? And yet that's where Job has gotten. I'm not suffering like Job, and again, I'm not trying to dismiss what he's going through. But Job has gotten to the point where he's demanding for God to explain what he's done. God does not have to answer that. He does not have to explain who he is or what he's done. Just because we're suffering doesn't change the fact that we now have permission to ask God and question God what he's doing. And brethren, we need to have this idea so ingrained in our minds that when we suffer, we don't slip to the point where Job does to where he starts making demands of God. We need to have this idea that we can't question God so drilled into our minds that we can look in the mirror when we think to ask God what he's doing, we can look in the mirror and say, you are not right in this. Because that is what Elihu tells Job. That's what the Holy Spirit has preserved for us, and that's the right way to look at it, I would suggest. We cannot question God. And if you think it's just Elihu's words, remember the, the words of God that, that, he, that he's going to, to come in right after Elihu and say. Um, Bud read some of them earlier, but he says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? God says to Job. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning? Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Gird up your, mo your loins like a man and instruct me. God waited patiently for Job, but to a point. And finally, he's going to step in and put Job back in his place. Elihu is, is the preamble, if you will. His, his six chapters lay the foundwork for what God is going to say immediately after. Um, and God says the same thing. Who are you, Job? To question the Almighty. When we suffer, we need to have that in mind. Who am I to question the Almighty? I don't have to understand it. But I can't just accept God when everything's going well and not accept him when things aren't. That's not who we've committed our lives to be. It's not our place to ask God why things are happening. Because if we understand God in his nature, we know that it is impossible for God to commit injustice. Job knew that, and he keeps saying that over and over throughout the book. It doesn't make sense. I didn't do anything wrong, and yet I'm suffering. How can that be? And Job's three friends say, well, clearly you did something wrong because you are suffering. God cannot commit injustice. He is not going to punish us for something we didn't do. It's against his nature. So, um, chapter 34, beginning of verse 10. Therefore, listen to me, you men of understanding. He's talking to all the Job and the three friends now. Listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to do wrong. He pays a man according to his work and makes him find it according to his way. Surely God will not act wickedly and the Almighty will not perverse justice. 
God cannot do something unjust. If it seems like you are suffering unjustly, the problem is on our end, not on God's end. It's problem, the problem is with our understanding of the circumstances, not on God's judgment. God cannot commit injustice. Chapter 37, verse 23 says something similar. The Almighty, we cannot find him. He is exalted in power, and he will not do violence to justice and abundant righteousness. Job was not suffering because he did something wrong. We know the story. It's easy for us to, to say, well, yeah, that was, a, that was a debate between God and, and Satan, and that's why this is happening. Job wasn't privy to that. Elihu wasn't privy to that. The three friends weren't privy to that. Um, we understand that. Um, but Job is, is wrestling with this as Elihu speaks to him. But sometimes God does punish people and does cause people to suffer because they've done something wrong. And sometimes when we suffer, it's because we dug our own hole. That, that does happen. Um, and, and we certainly can't complain. Um, if I rob a bank and I'm thrown in jail, I can't sit behind bars and complain about my situation. We understand that. If I don't raise my kids right and they get to be teenagers and they're wild and rebellious, I can't complain about that um, because I dug my own hole there. Um, sometimes that happens, and that is God being just, not unjust. Um, chapter 34, um, beginning in verse 21. Um, I don't really think we probably need to emphasize this. I think we understand it, but I will anyway because these are life use words. For his eyes are upon the ways of a man, and he sees all his steps. There is no darkness or deep shadow when the workers of iniquity, where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. He does not need to consider a man further, that he should go before God in judgment. He breaks the pieces in pieces, mighty men without inquiry. He sets others in their place. Therefore, he knows their works. He overthrows them in the night, and they are crushed. He strikes them like the wicked in a public place, because they turned aside from following him and had no regard for any of his ways. He will punish men. And that can be a cause of suffering. Um, and again, it's not our place to question his suffering. Maybe it's just, maybe it's not, but it's, or maybe our punishment is just. Maybe it's a totally different reason. Um, but regardless, um, we need to be very careful about questioning God for his judgment. But sometimes God causes us to suffer for our own good. And that may seem like an odd thing to do. But again, God being, his thoughts being higher than our thoughts and his way higher than our ways, he allows things to happen in a way that we might not understand. Again, look at the big picture of Job. Does Job not come out a stronger, a more faithful, a more righteous man than he was before? Do we not think that God knew what the end of the story was going to be when Satan's asking him to, to, for permission to, to afflict Job? Job's not, or God isn't trying to teach Satan a lesson. He's trying to teach Job a lesson. And in so doing, he teaches us a lesson to do today that sometimes there's a reason why we're suffering, even though we may not understand it at the time. It can be for our own good. Uh, verse 17 of chapter 33. Um, that he may turn man aside from his conduct and keep him from pride. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from passing over into Sheol. Um, Maybe we haven't done anything wrong, but maybe God's concerned with the direction we're going. And he may allow us to suffer in a way that seems unfair so that we will turn before we get to that point of sin. Um, that's another reason that Elihu offers as a possible reason for suffering. But whatever the reason, again, remember that you are not right in this to question God. Elihu teaches us a lot about this fundamental question of suffering. Um, a few more thoughts on Elihu as, as we move on. It's interesting, as I said before, we don't read a mention of Elihu before he starts to speak. And immediately when he's done, at the end of chapter 37, God speaks. We don't even know what Job say, would say in response to Elihu. That's not recorded if he even had a chance because God speaks out of the whirlwind. Um, and we don't ever see a, another mention in Scripture to this man, Elihu. Um, so he, main, he remains a bit of a mystery um, to us, but his words are sound. Um, they line up with what God is about to say at the end of the chapter. Um, these chapters at the end of Job are among my favorite in all of Scripture, this powerful poetry where God 
puts Job in his place. And Job says, behold, I am insignificant. And God says, I'm not done yet. And goes on for two more chapters and puts him in his place even more so. Um, a lie whose words line up with what God is going to, to say there. And I, again, encourage you to read that and, and compare a lie whose words with, with God's words there. Um, at the end of Job, we, we see God correcting Job in those last, those last four chapters. And finally, at the very end, he corrects Eliphaz and the three friends, the, he, those three men who corrected Job. He says, you were not right. God says that to them and requires a sacrifice out of them um, for their sin because they condemned without cause. Um, so God corrects Job. He corrects the three friends. God does not correct Elihu. To me, that suggests that, well, God clearly is in the, talking about correcting people in the story of Job prior to that point, and he doesn't stop and correct Elihu. Um, that suggests to me that what Elihu said didn't need correcting because it was sound, because it was right. His words, in contrast to most all of the three friends' words and Job's words, um, progressively throughout the, the book, um, Elihu's words were true. They were right. Um, and God did not correct him. And that's a tribute to who Elihu is and what he had to say. Um, but there's another piece of evidence that is not obvious at all, but I think is, think is worthwhile. Um, Elihu, we don't see a mention of him again, but his name lives on. Um, some, of you, some of you know, I, I, I kind of like these... Uh, um, when we read these genealogies in scriptures, Mark's been teaching um, Ezra and Nehemiah, and there's all these lists of genealogies that we just gloss over. I like those lists. Um, and I like to see patterns in those lists. Um, and I like to notice what names are recycled um, by the Jews. Um, they, didn't name, they didn't name their children something just because they liked the name. They, they had a reason for it. Um, it's interesting names that they don't use. Um, in Jewish culture and mindset, you don't see them use names like Noah ever again, or Abraham, or Moses, or Aaron, or Daniel, or David. Those, those names are not used again in Scripture. There seems to be a, a certain level where they won't reuse a name. Job is on that level. There's no more Jobs in Scripture. He was such a righteous man, they didn't use his name again. On the flip side, you don't see names again like Ahab and Jezebel. You don't see Korah. You don't see, uh, um, you don't see uh, another Manasseh after he's used. When people are of a certain level of evil, they shy away from those names as well. Um, Job is not used again. Neither of the three friends used again. Their names are not, not that they were evil men, but they have a negative connotation in Scripture. They are not reused anywhere else that we have in Israelite records in Scripture. But Elihu is. Elihu's used again at least four or five times that we know in the direct form. The Jews reused his name because they didn't put him on the same level of Job, but they understood that Elihu was a good man who had good things to say. Um, and that's a, a circumstantial argument, but one that uh, I think is, we'd be remiss to ignore as well. A lie who has valuable things to offer us. Um, and hopefully he's offered us something tonight as we've looked at the story of Elihu. Um, again, maybe you were already familiar with Elihu. Maybe you weren't. But consider his words. Go back and read 32 through 37. Um, understand his argument as he tries to correct Job, and let's learn from, from his words for us that God has preserved. Again, I appreciate your attention. Um, I understand that some of you don't like some of the, the nitty-gritty of, of uh, Old Testament history like I do. I appreciate your attention. Um, but again, it's there for a reason, and we can learn from it. Um, if you have not accepted the fact that the Almighty is just, that he is our creator, that doesn't change the fact that he is the creator and that he is just. He did make us. We will answer to him. Um, that doesn't change whether we accept it or not. That's a reality. It's a, it's a truth. Um, so 
choosing not to believe it won't change the reality of, of, of the fact that we d will stand in judgment before him. So if, if we don't accept that yet, why not? We need to make that choice. We need to understand that he is the Almighty and we are the creature and we owe him our service. We owe him our life. We need to dedicate our lives to him. That's what he expects. That's what Job understood. That's what Elihu understood. That's what we need to understand. Um, if we can help you in that, come talk to us. We will sit down with you and show you what else God's word has to say. For most of us here, let's consider how we stand before God. Let's, let's consider whether or not we're drifting away like Job was because of his suffering. If our circumstances, whatever they are, are leading us in a direction that's not where we need to go, let's listen to Elihu. Let's listen to each other. Let's help each other as we try to get on God's one path. If we can help you in any way, please let us know as we stand and sing.